Good morning. Welcome to Books at the Bottom of the Stairs. My name's Lorene. I'm going to talk to you about books that I would suggest for book clubs. Some of these books are ones that I have liked a lot, some not so much, because what I looked for in books were discussion points or um, plot lines that would generate some kind of conversation. Um, they are not... I don't think, in, yeah, there's one or two classics, um, but overall they're just things I've read in the last two years, and I believe that there are uh, two books that Steve has recommended. My book club, well, that that's <laughs> what didn't happen this year, which usually happens, is uh, with my long, long, long time group of lady friends, we do a book swap. And uh, this year we only had a partial book swap. Um, between one thing and another, uh, three people, three people out of six people didn't bring books to share around. So uh, that meant for a fairly tiny uh, amount of book shuffling and I had brought a fair number of books and and there wasn't a lot of pickup. It was, it was not an amazing event. <laughs> so um, what's that got to do with the price of tea in Welland Canal? Um, why did I mention that? Oh, because Steve quite often has nonfiction books that I take along, and the ladies quite often like his nonfiction options. And um, they all said, and I have not read it, read it, so I can't recommend it. They all said that they loved uh, the eel, and I'll have to put that in the information below because I don't remember the author. But they said at least two of them said it was one of the best books they've read this year. So um, maybe I should pop a little blurb up in it. I'm not going to do the best of 2023, but for them, it was a, a really resounding success. Will it make a good book club book? I really don't know. But uh, if you're looking for a nice read, that's one. All right. In terms of um, what I was looking for were either books that I had scored four or five over the course of the last two years. And as I was going through my list of books, I was thinking, yep, yep, that was good, that was good. And then there were, but the question is, can you get a discussion out of them? Out of them? And that took out um, all the YA books and all the middle grade books, all the nonfiction books, except for one that Steve's recommending. And then I took out a bunch of others because there were mysteries or maybe they were um, more, I don't know, character driven, but with not a ton of, of storyline attached to them. So uh, I felt that there needed to be a good balance between plot, setting, um, crisis topics and the characters themselves in order for it to be a good book. Okay. The first one that I'm going to talk about is called In Search of April Rain Tree. This is the 25th anniversary edition, and it was written by Beatrice Moissonnier. She is of Métis descent, and this was published, um, oh, we had a big discussion. Um, this one was published in 2008, but that's not when it was first published. Where is the first published? I'm going to say 1972. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it was one of the first books that was published in Canada that had to do with uh, both a Métis experience and a Métis author. And a number of uh, Canadian writers have said that this was a this was a pivotal book for them, both in um, a character that was First Nations, the t the issues that these two young girls encountered and uh, their own, th these other next generation writers' um, own interests and events and experiences and so forth. So this is an underpinning book. It's not really a gateway book in the sense that uh, you have to read this first in order to enter the genre of indig Indigenous writers or Indigenous um, reflections in a book, but it's more opening the door or maybe kicking the door in even. <laughs> and. So what is it about? It's about two sisters that have parents who are both um, alcoholics and drug addicts back in the um, 
in what they called the, the scoop. And I guess that was in the 70s. And um, these children are put into foster care. And they're put with white families who, who either sort of just let them be children. In the case of the younger sister, Cheryl, she was housed with a group of people that, or a family, sorry, that were pretty just accepting of who Cheryl was. And then there was the experience of the older sister, April, who was basically experienced the same kind of trauma that was in the residential schools in terms of de-indifying, Indianifying the children. Also, um, if they weren't actively trying to do that, they were just cruel, mocking, um, refusing privilege, or, or even in some cases, just basic uh, humanity. So April, the older of the two, goes through a lot more hardship than Cheryl does. Cheryl is in a situation that allows her to embrace her Métis background. April is in a situation where she's continually uh, hiding it. The big significant difference between Cheryl and April is that April is pale enough that she can pass for white. Cheryl is, um, is she's, she's got a, a darker skin tone, she's got darker eyes, her hair is darker, and um, I guess, I mean, we never actually see a, a picture in here of what the girls look like, but um, I guess there's some facial features that, that clearly classify her as not white. April, on the other hand, does pass as white, and that's her childhood experience, and um, she feels that this is going to be a good track for her in her adult life, whereas Cheryl is really, you know, keen to um, go in and be part of the the cultural awakening of First Peoples, First Peoples and, um, and so I don't want to tell anything more about the story. I think it's very interesting from a, it's a historically uh, accurate depiction of what happened. It's sort of a groundbreaker. And so if you've read any of Catherine Vermet or any of the, you know, just more contemporary authors, I think that it's a very interesting uh, compare and contrast to anything you might have read. And also the, the, the sort of stylistic issues. It's not a sophisticated book, but it still has very interesting um, technical methodology, methodology that's going into the writing of this book. I think it would be a great one for discussion, especially if you have done any contemporary readings and just to see you know, the uh, the comparison between the two. If you haven't read a whole lot of uh, contemporary um, First Nations writers, then I, I think this is also just a great starting point, and you will start to see what some of the issues are that you would encounter if you were to explore this further. Okay, so my book club gave it a good, a good rating, and um, I have another one that's Canadian. This is called Swamp Angel by Ethel Wilson. It's also um, an, an oldie. I find it a, a really a lovely book. And um, I think it was, they're just not, these books are not, first published in 1954. Okay, what we have here is Maggie Lloyd. She is on a second marriage. Let me show you the cover. Sorry, there we go. She is in her second marriage. Her first marriage was really delightful and um, she, she kind of finds herself in a second marriage almost by accident. And um, in the 50s, you know, that would have been just what you often did as a widow. You would just seek out another husband. I don't think she really needed to. And I think at a certain point she realized she didn't need to either. So she walks out on it and she goes, <coughs> pardon me, she goes to a fishing lodge in the lodge in the interior of British Columbia, and there she is almost too competent. She's working for a family who is kind of struggling to make the fishing lodge run, and she just has a lot of of the knowledge that they need. So instead of being simply the cook, she becomes almost the um, oh, what would you say? Sort of the leader by default, if that makes sense. So there's there's this whole euphoria and honeymoon of people coming together and really you know enjoying each other's company, and then things start to go a little bit sideways. So um, 
I think this was really a lovely book. I um, has, she has a really interesting friend who's still back in Vancouver, and the mom. And there is a very interesting little side story about a pearl-handled revolver. So um, I really thought this was delightful. Again, it's sort of a it's sort of a classic. I think once we have another maybe ten years under our belts as far as um, Canadian publishers and authors and so forth. This one will come back up to the, uh, sorry, that blurred. This one will come back more into the focus. I think it's a little bit unnoticed at the moment, but you can get it at the bookstores quite easily. Okay, the third book I'm going to suggest, I don't have a, an actual copy of, I'll try and put a picture in. It's uh, The Gunkle, G-U-N-C-L-E, by Stephen Rowley, R-O-W-L-E-Y. It's humorous, it's American, and it's um, not one that, hmm, I don't think it's gonna cause a huge amount of debate, but I think that it's it's delightful and it's for when most book books book clubs will come to a point where they go, we need something easy after that one, or let's find something a little bit funny for the next one. So I don't think this one is going to cause a lot of contention between the you know fellow members, um, but I think it will be a, a nice of a gentle, gentle rollick for you. It's uh, Stephen Rawley is the author who has also written Lily and the Octopus and the editor, in case you are familiar with those books. Patrick, or Gay Uncle Patrick, Gup for short, has always loved his niece and nephew. That is, he loves spending time with them when they come out to Palm Springs for the week-long visits, or when he heads to Connecticut for the holidays. But in terms of caretaking and relating to two children, no matter how adorable, Patrick is honestly overwhelmed. So when tragedy strikes and Maisie and Grant lose their mother and Patrick's brother, brother has a health crisis of his own, Patrick finds himself suddenly taking on the role of primary guardian. Despite having a set of gunkle rules ready to go, Patrick has no idea what to expect, having spent years barely holding on after the loss of his great love. And so we go. It's an interesting uh, little family visit, family vignette. The dad who's had health issues of his own, certainly some interesting topics there in terms of what he's doing in order to parent or is he trying to get away from not parent like is he trying to avoid parenting so there's there's just some very interesting things and the two kids are pretty cool too and um, they are not the primary feature of the book but um patrick is mm -hmm. so in case you you know get worried about a book that contains children's opinions it it will not harm you okay i think that one's a good one for fun I was a little surprised to find out how many of the books I pulled out for these recommendations are Canadian. I didn't do that on purpose, but it just I guess that just reflects that my reading uh, choices have become a little more Canadian in the last two years. And also, <laughs> there's just some pretty good books out there. Okay, so this is Wild Geese. Oh, there's a bit of a reflection there. You can see, oh, can I get it so there's no reflection? No, no. I hope that doesn't drive you crazy. Okay, Wild Geese by Martha Ostenso. This also is a book from Ye Oldies. And um, first, follow, uh, first copyrighted in 1925. And um, I think there's an afterword now with uh, David Arneson, who I do not know. In a farming community on the wind spread... Oh, let me do that again. <laughs> In a farming community on the wind spread... <laughs> wind swept plains of northern Manitoba the fiery Judith Gar struggles for freedom from her far father's brutal controlling rule told with vigor and lyric beauty wild geese is a powerful and erotic evocation of life stripped to its fundamentals and a poignant exploration of passion need and isolation a sensation when it was first published the novel is recognized today as one of the forerunners in the new realist movement in Canadian writing. Uh, so it was great. It, and I believe, I believe I actually read this twice because I'm pretty sure I read this when I was in university just because my roommate was doing a Canadian uh, literature course and, and it was good then. 
and it was good just last year. I think there's quite a lot to discuss in here. And if you've done some of the more classic Canadian um, readings, you know that uh, a, an ongoing thread is the land against the uh, the person, the person against the land. That includes the weather and that includes the hardships of the pioneers and so on. So this is not quite so much that. It's much more about the realities of, of living in this rural community, living with a rural family that just has their hooks into each other because, you know, you really need to have one family member preparing this kind of work so that you don't have to. There's just an awful lot of, of sort of balancing of the different power structures. And then, you you know, you get a dad like this dad who like, Wah! you don't want that dad. So it's, um, it, it has quite a lot of topics for discussion. It's beautifully written. She really has a, a wonderful, wonderful sense of the land around her and the people around her in the community, not just the family. So this was, this was a really, really good book for me. Now, I have not seen that when my book club did not go for it. I think they were um, just not in the mood for this sort of um, angry father. Like, who needs an angry father? But but it was good. Uh, there's another one by Marie-Claire Blay, just not going to come to me right now, that also has got a very sort of looming, looming kind of familial problem that's going on. And, you know, the other one that kind of comes to mind as I'm talking is the Poisonwood Bible. Um, I think there are some interesting things between all three of those and um, that's why I think it would make uh, a good a good discussion. This is the selection that Steve has offered. The Age of Wood by Roland Enos. It's nonfiction. It's not too big. Uh, I think one of the reasons he would recommend it is mostly because it's one of those books where uh, you get a cultural, social history that everybody can latch on to. The things that are spoken about in here are not um, as if you were if you were doing the one on on seeds or viruses or something. You would have to spend an awful lot of time bringing yourself up to speed to understand what the topic is when you get into the good parts. This is. This book is, he said, a little bit plodding in the beginning just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. But then it can get really quite, quite engrossing. And it has a lot of research behind it, and I believe the author stays out of the book. So um, the topic is wood. It's not just for shipbuilding, although that's what we see, a beautiful ship on the cover. Um but wood is ubiquitous to all cultures at all times in all, um, you know, different eras of human history, even in the Bronze Age or the Stone Age and stuff. Wood was still a significant component part of our ability to survive. And this is what the author explores, just where it has been in our lives culturally and physically and yeah, um, talks also about violins and pianos and newspapers, so I think it's it's quite interesting. He really enjoyed it, and generally Steve is a sound recommendor. <laughs> okay, now this one's a bit contentious. We talked about it, Steve and I talked about it just a few minutes ago, and uh, it was like, mm, that was a weird book. I'm going to... A High Wind in Jamaica by Richard Hughes. Now, uh, when was this? Uh, it, it has children as the main entities, let's say, but this is not for young readers. This is not even a terrific YA one. It's definitely an adult voice that we have got in here. And um, it was first published in 1929. But there are pirates, there's all kinds of escapes, there's mystery, there's um, manipulation. Uh, so the kids are just kind of the vehicle for which this adventure story rotates around. And 
I did not give it a lot of high grades. I think it was about a three, about a three out of five that I gave it initially. Because to, there were a couple of points that just got a little bit implausible for me. So as we hit a couple of those moments, then, you know, my star ratings go down. But again, there's just some interesting things if you like to take apart an author's writing style or the choices that they make or um, why did he do this? Why did he do that? This is a great book because you're going to have many questions along those lines. And I think you're going to get uh, like a love it or hate it reaction. I don't think you'll get, I don't think you're going to get middle of the road kind of reactions with it. It's a dreamlight action. A masterpiece of concentrated narratives begin among the decayed plantation houses and overwhelming natural abundance of late 19th century Jamaica. It then moves on to the high seas as Richard Hughes tells the story of a group of children accidentally thrown upon the mercy of a crew of down-at-heel pirates. A tale of seduction and betrayal, of accommodation and manipulation, of weird humor and unforeseen violence, this classic of 20th century literature is unequaled exploration of the nature and limits of innocence. So, yeah, I think I'll be interested to hear if anybody picks this one up and, and runs with it, because I think it will be, um, if, if, you've, if you've had a bit of a dry spell, <laughs> I think it will just, it'll raise a lot of conversation for sure. All right, this one is a play, and it's American, A Raisin in the Sun. And it is by Lorraine Hansberry. I went on to in, uh, investigate Lorraine Hansberry to see whether she'd written anything else because this was so good. Uh, but she didn't. Uh, she she was mostly a journalist, but she also died quite young of cancer. So, uh, you know, total tragedy as far as I'm concerned because she, she is a beautiful writer. So it is a play. There's about, um, it's short enough that you could do it as a group read if you want something a little bit different where each of you take turns reading a different um, character. Maybe you could do it over two nights or just choose um, a section of the play. It was first produced in 1959 and it was awarded the New York Drama Critics Circles Award and hailed as a watershed in American drama. It is a pioneer, pioneering work by an African-American playwright and also a radically new representation of black life. It is an embattled Chicago family that we are meeting, and it anticipates the issues that range from generational clashes to the civil rights to the women's movement. She also posed the essential questions about identity, justice, and moral responsibility. And it's a great, great family dynamic story. Um, Basically, there's a black family living in a fairly impoverished situation, and they've been working quite hard to um, get up and get out. And mom has been saving money for a long time towards purchasing a home. And a neighborhood has come available, and it's within her price range. And uh, so she's bought the house, but it's a white neighborhood. And the realtor did not realize that mom was black because I guess she went through an agent. And so um, the equivalent of the homeowners association shows up and it's like, well, you know, we're thinking we could maybe buy you out. And, oh, what are you going to do with that? I mean, this family wants to get out of their poverty. They've worked really hard for it, but clearly they're not going to be welcomed in their new neighborhood. So it, it's... It's really fascinating. There's a son in there who also thinks, yeah, I don't want to move there. I want to use the money for this. He's got another game plan altogether. Son's wife is like, I don't know. I just want to smack you or just leave you behind. It's like she's just exhausted with husband. And there is a grandson in there who's kind of the, um, the hope of the future. But I'm not sure he wants to be the hope of the future. So, but he's young enough that he doesn't really know what he wants to do. So it's a, it's a slice out of their life. Um, I'm trying to remember now whether it was as much as a week or if it was even just two days. I, it's a very short time frame. So, and also a short book. It would also, it's less than 150 uh, pages. And uh, so it also could work if you just want something short. All right, I'm just recommending this author. I'm not so much recommending the book itself, although I really enjoyed it. And there were quite a number of discussion points. 
not so much as a book club with them, but a lot of my friends had read this book, so we were able to have a chat about it one day over coffee. And um, so I'm not really recommending the book. I am recommending Margaret Kennedy. I think she's a fail-safe author. She's um, The Constant Nymph is one of her books, and um, Troy Chimneys. They were all written in the 50s. And um, yeah, I think she died in 1967. She's um, a very poetic and lyrical writer. She's got a good sense of um, handling her characters. There are a fair number of characters and she doesn't, uh, they don't all fall into the same iconic spot. They, there's enough variation going on with all of her, her characters that it's a good it's a good cast. Now, I should have said back here, there's really only about six characters. There's four, four main characters, and then one or two not so, not so uh, prominent characters. So it, you're not having to deal with something like Shakespeare, where there's 76 different characters in the first act. Okay, so I just thought that uh, she has a good storyline. She's got good character development. She really knows how to write... Um, uh, setting. I'm talking about Margaret Kennedy now. <laughs> and I think that if you're looking for something that's a little bit bigger and a little bit more uh, plot oriented, that this is going to be a good author for you. And um, I also think that those three books are different enough that you should be able to find something that um, the gang all agrees on. Whether you're going to have a whole lot of contention I don't think so I think it's just going to be a really you know good solid book and um, not everything has to um, rattle your cage <laughs> it could actually be the one that everybody agrees on and likes okay the next four books that I'm bringing to you are all short they are all challenging but every once in a while a book club wants something where they don't have to put a whole ton of reading hours into it but I think each one of these that's coming next will certainly have some good conversations around them. This is my new absolute favorite. It's definitely going to be in the top 20 of my all-time favorites. And it's a reread for me. It's a rediscovery for me. Ray Bradbury is known more for his science fiction than anything else. But this has absolutely nothing to do with science fiction. It's just a wonderful, wonderful uh, a summer of 1928, it is a particularly interesting moment for a growing boy. It's a summer of green apple trees, mowed lawns, and new sneakers. On half burnt firecrackers of gathering dandelions of grandma's belly-busting dinner, it was a summer of sorrows and marvels and gold-fuzzed bees. A magical, timeless summer in the life of a 12-year-old boy named Douglas Spaulding. Remembered forever by the incom oh, remembered forever by the incomparable Ray Bradbury. <laughs> I don't get that last sentence. Why'd they throw that in there? Um, so yeah, Douglas is a little guy who has all of a sudden realized I'm alive. I mean, he's known he was alive before, but now he realizes that uh, he has agency. He has got awareness. He has he has got. Uh, um, first time experiences, so although in the past he's received a new pair of running shoes just about every summer, this is the first time he's really paid attention to it. So he starts a journal, and his brother, who um, doesn't want to be fully outdone, starts a different kind of journal of counting. <laughs> so where Douglas will notice that they have um, been helping Grandpa gather the dandelions for the dandelion wine that Grandpa makes, his brother will say we've made 18 bottles or something like that. So it's also about coming to awareness of life, but also coming to awareness of death. And a lot of the characters that we see, we don't necessarily revisit their kind of, he goes to visit the neighbor next door and we might see that neighbor again a little bit later, but it's more vignettes. And as Douglas visits with different people, he will sometimes be told the inner workings of, of what they are thinking about aging or being um, transitioning in some sort of direction, like maybe they're retiring or maybe they're getting married. And so he sees these stages and ages of life and has some kind of perceptions around them. So he's developing his perceptions around these moments, but so are the characters who are 
either telling the story or showing the story. And so we see their thinkings around it as well. So it's not just a one-sided um, set of perceptions. We've got Douglas's view of, of what's happening around him, but then we've, all got these, we've also got these individuals who are um, confronting, facing, or just contemplating. Nothing is like so dramatic that, you know, it's a crisis. This is not a crisis-driven book. It's more of um, just what would you call it? It's just a really nice roll through a summer. Well, if you want to read it in the summer, that would be good. I just thought of that now for a book club who likes to continue to read in the summer. This would be a good one. And uh, if you look for something in the winter to cheer you up, this would be a good one. I just adored it and I've recommended it to so many friends and those friends are recommending it. There's a little flurry of dandelion wine going on around Halifax. <laughs> oh, and I now see how I was, I kept spelling dandelion wine, D-A-N-D-Y, and getting spell check, getting really angry at me. And uh, then I put in the I where the Y was and I'm still getting errors and then I just thought, screw it, I'll just spell it wrong. But now I see it's D-A-N-D-E, lion. Yeah. That was very important. <laughs> All right. These next two are definitely short. They are, uh, we've got Foster by Claire Keegan, and she is also the author of Small Things Like These. Both books are so wonderful. We read Small Things Like These with uh, my one book club. It was, uh, it's, a be it's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful story. She's a poet in her other writings, and so we see that poetry, we see that sort of brevity of um, of plot and, and a sharp honing in on characters, and that's true in both books. So um, small things like these has to do with a gentleman who has um, discovered something. He's, he delivers coal to the different locations, businesses, and homes, and along the way he discovers something at the local convent and it upsets him. And what's he going to do about it? And if he does something about it, oh, he's not going to be a very popular man. If he doesn't do something about it, he's not going to be a happy man. So it's his dilemma over the course of one or two days trying to figure out, you know, just where he's going to fall on action and inaction and it is really beautiful. Now this one was also turned into a movie and I think I think the movie is called A Quiet Girl. Okay, what we have here is a young child that's been um, taken away from her family by her own parents. They've just got too many kids and so they've taken them to one of, I think the mom's sister and her husband who have recently lost a little boy. And so, um, the one sister with all the kids figures my sister without any kids can look after some of my kids while I'm having the, la the latest baby or maybe just exhausted from all the other babies. Anyhow, they just drop this little girl off and it's her coming to terms with uh, the, f the possibility of being cared for she, in, the, in the family with all the other kids. She's just one of a, a mob and just getting along and existing and you know, kind of hoping for the best every day and kind of benign neglect, more or less. And uh, the aunt and uncle who've lost the child are entirely different in their guardianship. And she just sees the possibility of love and inclusion and community. And uh, it's it has a very sad thread through the whole thing but it is also very, very beautiful. And I think there are a lot of discussion points that can be had on this. Now, I got it in hardcover. I'm sure that it's available in softcover, but it's just such such a beautiful little book. <laughs> All right. Okay, the last one is a challenge. The last one is for those book clubs amongst you who really like like to sort of sit on a thorn. <laughs> this is such a difficult book. It's called The Minted by Will McClelland. I don't think that he's written too much else, but oh my gosh, it's confusing. It has insane characters. There's a fantasy element. There's a, 
a magic element. There's a dystopian element. There's a bit of a romance in there. There's a moose. The queen of England is uh, has been kidnapped and put into the mint, the Can Royal Canadian Mint, and she's in charge. <laughs> she's in charge of making sure that the animals in the mint make sure that they produce coins that people will then use. And so the loon comes into the story, the beaver comes into the story, the elk. Now the moose is actually, reminds me a little bit of Louis Riel's story in terms of the way he, um, he's being chased by all the powers that be. Nobody wants his message to to come out they like they're trying to muffle them so the so the moose and the the narrator of the story are off on a track across Canada and it doesn't make any sense and the moose's platform kind of makes sense well then the moose also has a lover perhaps who's robotic perhaps <laughs> it's there's just so much perhaps and going on in this book and I, I almost had to read parts of it twice just to think, what on earth? So for those of you who, it's, it's really Canadian. It's taking place in the north, northern parts of across Canada. It's taking place across the railroad tracks of the um, Canadian Railway. Uh, the Canadian, my, uh, the Canadian uh, Mint comes into play. Parliament Hill comes into play. It's just all over the place and there's just so many Canadian dropped things in here. I really don't know what the plot is. It's um, And I, I, I really am not 100% sure what the author's intentions were. Now, if I was a more curious, well, no, I am a curious person, but I don't have a lot of follow through. So it would be worth going to find out what uh, um, Will McClellan thought he was doing. I don't know whether there's an interview with it, but I almost don't want to know. I, I kind of want to stay in my what the hell bubble. So um, yeah, I think, well, there are a lot of chapters in here. Some are only a paragraph long, but the book itself is 175 pages. And I uh, think again, there are going to be a lot of love them or hate them's in your book club over this. So really don't read this unless you're looking for a challenge yeah okay so that's it for me um that's sort of a, a roundup of the best books that i would recommend in the last two years and going forward i think i'll pay attention just you know think, oh that would make a good book club book for you know, doing this again i don't know what i'm going to do over the christmas week it all depends if i have look i've still got this big pile of books here and uh i have read five out of that pile but there's still about 11 more to go, something like that, and maybe more. I'm just going to be reading, and I'll perhaps let you uh, in on it. I know most of you are going to be busy yourselves with Christmas, and so um, no expectations, right? It's all about calories, love them or hate them. <laughs> I hope you guys all continue to have good reading dreams and wishes, and that they come true for you. Bye-bye for now.